Welcome everybody, so good to have you here today on every Parker Hill campus and a big shout out to those of you who are watching online as well. Today we're continuing this teaching series on the life of David. And David is one of the most prominent people in the pages of Scripture. His story covers multiple books, multiple chapters. And one of the reasons why his story is included in the Bible is because I believe there are some very valuable lessons that we need to learn about how we should live our lives. And today we're going to look at what is one of the most infamous and at the same time one of the most tragic chapters in David's story. Uh, It's this time in David's life when he sleeps with the wife of another man and she becomes pregnant and then David tries to cover up the whole thing by actually having her husband killed. Uh, This part of his story is is mind-boggling, it's tragic, it's frightening all at the same time, and it's mind-boggling because this is not what you would expect of a man like David, because earlier in David's life, this is the way that he was described. He was described as a man after God's own heart. In fact, in last week's message, I think we saw a great example of this when we left off David's story last week. uh, David was on the run, hiding in caves, just trying to stay alive until it was his time to take the throne of the nation of Israel. And one day, David has a golden opportunity, a perfect opportunity, uh, to kill King Saul, the one who was pursuing him. King Saul was trying to kill David, and David has this perfect opportunity to take him out, and he doesn't. In fact, here's where we left off last week. This is what David said to Saul. He said, may the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand, David says, will not touch you. You see, David was a man of honor. He was a man of integrity. He was a man of faith, at least at that point in his life. But then years later, David does something that is so bad and so deceptive and so selfish that it is absolutely mind-boggling. And and you read this part of the story uh, that we're going to be looking at today, and you just ask yourself, how could this happen? How could such a good man fall so incredibly far. And I think in order to make sense of this part of David's story that we're going to be looking at today, there's a very important distinction that you need to make, and it's this distinction, that David's downfall happened quickly, but it did not happen suddenly. And there's a big difference between those two things. In fact, let me try to illustrate that for you uh, this way. Let me just ask you, on every campus, if you've lived in the Scranton area for at least 23 years, go ahead and raise your hand. In fact, if you've been living here since at least April 5th, 1992, uh, go ahead and raise your hand if you've been living here that long. Be proud. Don't be ashamed if you're a lifer here. Okay, if you've been living here that long, you may remember what happened on that Sunday morning, April 5th, 1992, because that was the day of the great implosion There were six buildings on Lackawanna Avenue in downtown Scranton that had to be removed in order to make way for what is now the Steamtown Mall. And a demolition company was hired to come in and bring down those those, uh, six buildings. And so that was a big deal that day. I remember it because people were late for church. There was like live TV coverage on all the local stations. And uh, they brought these buildings down. And it only took about 15 seconds for the implosion to bring these buildings down. It happened really quickly, but it didn't happen suddenly. It was the result of a long process to get there. See, what happened before the implosion, before those 15 seconds, was a demolition company came in. They spent weeks drilling holes in the concrete support pillars, and then they packed uh, explosives into all those holes and then they fitted them with detonators and wired all the detonators together and and so even though the buildings came down in 15 seconds the fall of those buildings was the result of a process that had been happening for a long time for weeks perhaps a couple of months and let me tell you this whenever you see someone who has a downfall a spiritual fall a moral fall in their lives it may happen quickly But I'll tell you this, it never happens suddenly. So here's the lesson that I'm hoping we can take away today from David's life. It is this, that we always reach the bottom one step at a time. We always reach the bottom one step 
at a time. It's a matter of small decisions and small steps that we take every day. Like I've never met the teenager who said, you know what, my goal is to become an alcoholic by the time I'm I'm 21. Never met that person. Never met somebody who said, you know what, my goal for my life is to end up in bankruptcy court someday. Or I've never met the man who said, you know what, someday I'm hoping that I can just kind of blow up my family and alienate my kids. I've never heard anybody say those things, but there are a lot of people who end up in those places. And how do they get there? They get there one step at a time. One drink, one phone call, one credit card charge, one spending decision, you know, one lie. We just take one step after another step, make one decision after another decision, and eventually we end up somewhere we never thought we would, we would end up. We always reach the bottom one step at a time. And it happens slowly and subtly and deceptively. So today, uh, as we look at David's story, I'm going to point out five steps that David took on his path to destruction. It is a well-worn path. It's a path that millions of others have taken as well before and after David. But it's an important path for us to recognize. And my hope is that as we are able to see the path that David took, we can see ourselves when we begin to go down that path and perhaps change our ways and avoid the path that takes us to the point of destruction. So today, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 is where we are. If you have a Bible, you can uh, find that passage or you can bring it up on your mobile device. 2 Samuel chapter 11. I'll give you the context. Uh, At this point, David was right around 50 years old. At this point in his life, he was no longer tending sheep or fighting giants or hiding in a cave. Uh, He had been the king of Israel at this point in his life for about 20 years, and things were going really, really well. God had blessed him, given him great success. The nation of Israel was prosperous. The people loved their king. Other national leaders respected David and respected Israel, and things were going really well, and David was living at this point in his life in a palace in Jerusalem. And that brings us to the first step on the path toward destruction. It's this. It's success. And you may say, well, wait a, wait a minute, Mark. I, I don't get that. How can success be the first step on the path toward destruction? Well, it's simply this. Because when life is going well, you start to feel invincible. You forget how utterly dependent you are on God. We begin to get this subtle sense of pride that settles into our heart. And you begin to think, you know, even subconsciously that, you know, you don't really need God all that much. But it's different, see, in times of adversity, isn't it? When you're running through the wilderness and hiding in caves and when you're fighting giants, that's different because in adversity, we cling to God. We depend on Him. But in times of success, we can easily become proud and self-sufficient and begin to drift from God. In fact, there's a passage in the book of Proverbs, a different part of the Bible, that, that I really like. It says this in Proverbs chapter 30. It's a prayer. It says, God, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. But look at that middle phrase. I may have too much money, success, comfort, whatever it might be. I might have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? And and I get the sense that this is what was happening to David at this point in his life. I get the sense that he was just beginning to linger a little bit too long in front of the palace mirrors. I get the sense that he was beginning to listen a little bit too closely to the praise that was given him. I think he spent a little bit too much time being fascinated with his own success, and he began to drift away from God. And that becomes obvious as we continue telling his story here in 2 Samuel chapter 11. So step number one on this path toward destruction is success. But step number two is this. It's disengagement. Disengagement. Let's pick up in 2 Samuel 11 and verse 1. It it says this, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab, who was his commander, out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But listen to this. But David remained in Jerusalem. Now, you may read that, and you may think that's pretty much unrelated to the rest of the story that we're about to read, but it really isn't. This is a key component to what's going on in David's heart at this time. And the reason why the Bible points this out is that it was extremely rare for any king 
at that time in history to stay at home when his troops were out at battle. The king always wanted to be there with them, observing what was happening, um, you know, coaching his troops, talking about strategy with his commanders. And David especially, uh, if you know anything about David, you know that, that that was especially true for him. I mean, this was the guy who killed a bear with his own bare hands defending his father's sheep. This was the guy who took on the Philistine giant named Goliath. Uh, I mean, David used to be the guy who couldn't stay away from a battle, and now he says to himself, you know what, I've done my part, I've fought my fights, I need a little bit of me time. That's what David is saying. And he goes from David the warrior to David the vacationer, and I believe it was his lack of engagement in a bigger purpose that made David susceptible to the cheap thrills of this world. And let me tell you this, I think one of the best safeguards against temptation is just to be busy with a higher purpose. And I think that's why maybe some of you could be easy prey for temptation is because you're just bored. You're not living the life of courage and servanthood that God wants you to be living and you become a passenger instead of a crew member and you're disengaged and you're sitting on the sidelines. And that's a really dangerous place to be when it comes to temptation. Years ago, I came across this quote that was originally penned in the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, Just listen as I read it to you. The writer says this, Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or it will be killed. Every morning, a lion wakes up. It knows it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. It doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle, when the sun comes up, you'd better be running. You know what David's problem was? David stopped running. He was no longer chasing the goals and dreams that God had for his life. He had settled in, and since he was no longer pursuing a bigger goal or dream, temptation began to pursue him. And I think one of the best ways you can resist the temptations of this world is simply to be busy and to be preoccupied with a higher purpose that God has for you. So success was the first step down that path. Disengagement was the second step on the pathway. And then step number three is this, temptation. Come to verse two. It says, one evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof of the palace, he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful and you know scripture doesn't always comment on the physical appearance of someone so I think it's important when scripture comments here and says that she was very beautiful that means she was very beautiful an incredible temptation for David now for years whenever I read this I looked at this and I thought well you know David was just out walking around he happened to be there he happened to see her it was all just a big accident and poor David But, you know, the more I thought about that, the more I believe that's really not the case. I think David knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, Let me explain what I mean. In in our culture today, uh, I think we would all all recognize that a a woman likes to take a hot bath, okay? That's what keeps Bed Bath & Beyond in business. And that's true in our culture. It was also true in David's culture a few thousand years ago that was true. But the difference was, in that day, you couldn't just turn on the hot water faucet on the whirlpool tub and crank that up until the hot water runs out and the person after you has to wait 30 minutes before he can take his shower. Not that that's ever happened to me. I'm just speaking hypothetically. Um, But in those days, they didn't have faucets, so they would literally put a bathtub on the roof of the house. And during the day when the sun was up, the sun would heat the water in the tub. And so at the end of a very sunny day, you'd have a warm tub of water in which you could bathe. And it says here that David was walking around on the roof of the palace. The palace was always the highest building in any city. And from that vantage point, David could see everything. See, I think David knew exactly what he was doing when he went up on the roof that day. I think David knew exactly what he was going to see. This was the Old Testament version of browsing the internet late at night when you're all by yourself. See, David was intentionally in his boredom, in his success, in his disengagement. David was intentionally putting, putting himself in the path of temptation. But here's the thing. Over and over in Scripture, when it comes to temptation especially sexual temptation, there's one command that Scripture gives to us, and it says this, we are told to flee from temptation. David was doing just the opposite. 
He was looking for it. Kind of like the guy, you know, I, I heard about who was supposedly on a diet, and then one morning he comes into work with a bag of donuts, half of which had already been eaten, and his co-workers started giving him a really hard time because, after all, he was supposed to be on a diet. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. He said, on the way to work this morning, I, I prayed about this. I prayed and I said, Lord, if you want me to have some donuts this morning, show me a sign. Lord, if you want me to stop at that bakery, you just make sure there's an open parking spot right there in front of the bakery. And he said, I prayed that, and sure enough, on the seventh time around the block, there was an open spot right there. That was David. David was not avoiding temptation. He was circling. He was looking for it. He was finding it also. And then it says he doesn't just stop with looking. Verse 3 says, and David sent someone to find out about her. He's intrigued. He wants to know a little bit more about her. You know, he sends her a friend request. David's trying to move further and further down this path of temptation. But here's the thing. The farther you move down that path of temptation, I've learned this, the harder it gets to change course. There was a book that was written in the 1400s called The Imitation of Christ. It's still a pretty big seller today. It was written by a guy named Thomas Akempis. And one of the chapters in this book, The Imitation of Christ, talks about temptation. And listen to these words from Thomas Akempis. He says this. He says, we must be especially alert against the beginnings of temptation. For the enemy is more easily conquered if he has refused admittance to the mind and is met beyond the threshold when he knocks. In other words, the easiest time to deal with temptation is when it's still outside of your life and outside of your mind and outside of your heart. Because once you allow it inside, it's a lot harder to resist. I would simply put it this way. It's always easier to avoid temptation than resist it. Always easier to avoid it than resist it. Resist it. Here's what that means very simply. Guys, if you have a problem with watching porn every time you go to a hotel room, you call ahead to the hotel and tell them to disconnect the TV in your room, and they will do that for you. Or maybe if you're somebody here and you have a problem with overspending, don't go to the mall. Don't hang out there. Don't go there to have your lunch at the food court, okay? If you have a problem with gossip, stay off social media. See, it's a lot easier to avoid temptation than to resist it. David doesn't avoid it. And what happens is he's becoming more and more and more captured by it. So he sends someone to find out about this woman that he has seen when he's up cruising the internet in the evening. Verse 3, here's the response he gets. The man said, and this guy's probably one of his servants. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Like, when you're a servant, you have no right to tell the king what to do. But this servant was wise enough to ask a good question. He's saying, David, you do know who this is, don't you? You do know who you just told me to go find out about. This is somebody's daughter. You know that, don't you? This is somebody's wife. Because here's the thing about sexual temptation. We tend to objectify people. Men do that, especially with women. And this servant says, you, don't, you do know who this is, don't you? And, and this question from the servant, this should have been like a big red flashing idiot light on David's dashboard telling him to pull over and get off the road. But David just kind of ignores it and turns up the stereo and hits the accelerator and he just keeps on going. I mean, it's incredible how his heart has changed and how calloused his heart has become success distraction, temptation. And if you dwell on temptation long enough, here's where you end up, and that is step number four, and that is action. He takes action. Verse four, then David sent messengers to get her. And I just, you know, I read in that a sense of entitlement. It's as if David is saying, listen, I killed Goliath. I'm the king of Israel. I write psalms. I have a right to do whatever I want to do. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he slept with her. One night, just one time, just one sin. Nobody would ever know except a few trusted servants, and he knew they would never tell anybody. At least that's what David thought. But as you read the rest of David's story, here's what you discover. This one decision would end up bringing David a lifetime of pain. 
It would, because this was not the end of the story. A few weeks later, Bathsheba discovers that she's eating everything in the house. And so she gets into her chariot and goes down to CVS and she gets a pregnancy test. In verse 5, then the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Again, there's a warning light flashing on David's dashboard. He's got a decision to make right here and right now. And at this point, he could have just, uh, when he got word of this pregnancy, he, he could have taken responsibility. He could have told everyone the truth. He came to this moment of decision. He could have done the right thing, but instead he just keeps going down the same path, just compounding the sin. Here's what he does. Verse 6, he's a very clever man. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. This would be Bathsheba's husband. And Joab sent him to David. Remember, Uriah and Joab, they're out on the battlefield. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was and how the soldiers were and how the war was going. How's my buddy Joab? How are all the other guys doing out there? How's the battle going these days? They probably talked about college football because they're guys, you know, they're talking. And David says, wow, huh, Uriah, look at the time. You know what? It's way too late in the day to send you back out to the battlefield. How about you just go home for the night? Here's what it goes on to say. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. That means get cleaned up, get comfortable, and whatever else comes to mind. He's thinking, you know what, if he can just sleep with his wife, then nobody would ever be the wiser. No DNA testing back in those days. But here's what it says. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. Verse 10. But David was, David was told, Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign, Uriah? Uh, why don't you go home? And listen to what Uriah said here. This is absolutely incredible. Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. My master Joab and my Lord's men, my band of brothers, are camped in the open fields. And then he says this, How could I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife as surely as you live? I will not do such a thing. I mean, I mean, Uriah was a man of incredible honor. He was so loyal to the king. He was so loyal to his fellow soldiers. He was so loyal to God. And I think at this moment, for David, it must have been almost like looking into a mirror and seeing the man that he used to be. Because David used to be this kind of man. And you would think in this moment, David would just be convicted by this, but he, but he isn't. Again, his, his heart has become hardened. His conscience is so seared that instead of just stopping right here in his tracks, he comes up with plan B. Verse 12, then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And so David says, you know what, maybe we need to have a party. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him and David made him drunk because even the most honorable men will sometimes lose their honor when they've had too much to drink. But in the evening, excuse me, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In other words, <laughs> Uriah had more integrity when he was drunk than David did when he was sober. And so David, in his success, in his disengagement, in his temptation, in his action towards sin, eventually comes to this final step on the path, which is destruction. And this is so tragic and so painful. Verse 14, in the morning... David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is the fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. And imagine this, Uriah is carrying the letter that is going to get him killed. And so David says to Joab, go ahead, engage in battle, pull the rest of the guys back. And Joab being the obedient leader that he was. Did it, verse 16. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And sure enough, when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Now, now don't miss this phrase. Some of the men in David's army fell. In other words, Uriah was not the only innocent soldier who died that day. 
There were children who lost their fathers. There were wives who lost their husbands, all because of the selfishness and all because of the sin of one person. And it's a great reminder that we don't live isolated lives. None of us do. All of our decisions have a ripple effect. And you can say, yeah, well, this is just my own little deal and this is private, but it never is. There's always a ripple effect that, that begins to affect the people closest to you. So skip down to verse 26. Here's how this part of David's story ends. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. As far as David could tell, the plan worked out just fine. He was still the king, had a beautiful new wife, cute little son, and nobody would ever know except for a few trusted servants. But see, this was not the end of the story. Verse 27 ends with what may be one of the greatest understatements anywhere in the Bible. It says, but the thing David had done displeased the Lord. And here's how the rest of David's story plays out. Eventually, because of this one decision that he made, David experiences pain for years and decades. This son that was eventually born to Bathsheba would die. Several of David's other children ended up rebelling against him. One of his sons even goes to war against him. And, and David has such remorse and, and all of that flows out of this decision he made. And this is the very nature of temptation. It looks so appealing on the surface. And it holds out to us the promise of pleasure, but it hides the reality of the pain behind it. Uh, a few years ago, great example of how temptation and sin work. Uh, a few years ago, the Michigan State Police found a very creative method for catching some of the most elusive criminals who were still at large in the state of Michigan. They sent letters to the last known addresses of about 200 fugitives. And the letter told these fugitives that they had won a free television set. And when they come to claim the television set, they would be entered in a drawing to win a new car. And in order to claim their TV and get in the drawing, they had to come to the Pontiac Silverdome on a particular day at a particular time. Seventy criminals fell for it and were immediately arrested when they came to claim their prize. This, my friends, is the nature of temptation. It holds out the promise of happiness and joy and fulfillment to us, but when we step into it, we discover that it is a trap and we find ourselves so so locked down and tied up and messed up and this is the nature of temptation it looks so appealing on the surface but it holds great pain beneath the surface and this was david's story not the end of his story but this was a huge part of his story and we hear a story like this and we wonder how someone who was once described as a man after god's own heart how could he ever get to the point where he could do something like this how could he take someone else's wife and then take the life of that innocent man how did he ever get there i'll tell you how he got there it didn't happen suddenly he got there the same way you and i get there one step at a time we all reach the bottom one step at a time one step at a time now i don't know where this lands with you but i i, I think there are basically two groups of people here two broad categories and there are a couple of statements that that I think people hearing this message might be making. Here's the first statement that you might be making in your own mind. It would be this one. That could never happen to me. Let me tell you what. It could. It, it could. I can tell you that it could. I mean, here's David. David was a man after God's own heart. The same guy who had enough faith to take on the Philistine giant named Goliath. This was the guy who wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. And listen, if David could fall any single one of us, can fall as well maybe not in the same way maybe not to the same extent but all of us are susceptible and maybe for you god brought you here today just to hear a word of warning from david's life just to understand the path that you may be on and where that path will probably lead you even if you don't think it will and maybe today what god is saying to you is listen you need to step off of that path onto a different path about a year ago, I heard something that Mark Fitch uh, talked about in a message that he did. Uh, it's from a book um, about change, and this is entitled Choosing to Change 
in five days. And some of you just need to hear this today. This is what God brought you here for. Choosing to change in five days. Here's how it goes. Day one, I went for a walk down a street. I fell into a hole. I didn't see it. It took me a long time to get out. It's not my fault. Day two, I went for a walk down the same street. I fell in the same hole. It took me a long time to get out. Why did I do that? Day three, I went for a walk down the same street. I fell in the same hole. I got out quickly. It is my fault. Day four, I went for a walk down the same street. I saw the hole. I walked around it. Day five, I went for a walk down a different street. And maybe for you here today, you're on a path that's not taking you to any place good, and you need to choose a different street. You need to choose a different path than the one that you're on today. And maybe today... You just need that word of warning because you're saying, you know what, that could never happen to me. Hey, it could. Some of you might be saying this on the other hand. Some of you might be here today and you're saying, you know what, that already happened to me. And the truth is, some of you may walk away from a message like this feeling guilty, feeling a little bit beat up, because you hear David's story and you hear some of your own story in that, because you've been down that path at least part way and you carry the regrets and you carry the guilt And you're trying to get past that. And so I want to end today not only with a word of warning, but also with a word of hope. And let me tell you what's so interesting to me about this story from David's life. You roll the clock ahead hundreds of years, and the Jewish Messiah comes. His name is Jesus. And Jesus was born in the city of David in Bethlehem. And in Matthew's gospel, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew gives this long string of names, uh, the genealogy of Jesus, his ancestry. And and you come to this one section beginning in verse 5, and let me show you what it says. This is just describing his genealogy. Obed, the father of Jesse, talked about Jesse four weeks ago, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife oh you had to bring that up in the middle of the genealogy see david's son solomon was the father of rehoboam and eventually get down to jesus himself but it was david's son by bathsheba who was part of the lineage of the savior and in my opinion god was sending a powerful message in the way that he brought his son into the world and the powerful message is this even if you've blown it like david did Even if you've shattered your life, there is forgiveness. There is hope for you. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And in your mess and on the path that you've been on, Jesus steps into that mess and he steps onto that path. And he says, I forgive you. Now go and sin no more. And I just want to say, you know, if you're here and you're new to this church, I want you to know a little bit about this church. Our goal is not to allow only perfect people to walk through these doors. Our goal is to reach the most messed up, the most fallen, the most maxed out sinners in northeastern Pennsylvania. And many times you can look around the room and be convinced of that, quite honestly. But that's who we are. And if that's how you feel, then this is the place for you. And maybe for you, God brought you here today to hear not a warning, but a word of hope. And for you to hear God say to you, listen, I have not given up on you. And if you will simply humble yourself, and if you will, if you will be honest with yourself, and if you will just ask forgiveness, you will find freedom, you will find hope, and you will find cleansing. And next week, we're going to see the rest of David's story, because we're going to see how David goes from this lowest point in his life defining forgiveness, and then moving forward into the, the life that God really wanted him to have. And, and just to foreshadow that, I want to end today just by reading some of David's own words. So I'm going to have your campus pastor come back up as I close. And I want to close by reading one of the Psalms, uh, because this part of the Bible that we've been looking at today in 2 Samuel, that tells the, the narrative, the story of David's life. But David also has a number of writings in the book of the Bible that we call the book of Psalms. And I want you to hear his words from Psalm 32, especially for those of you today who are on that path or you've been down that path. 
Just close your eyes. I'm not going to put the words on the screen. Just close your eyes and let these words wash over you from Psalm 32. David says this, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. When I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity, then I acknowledged my sin to you. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. And he ends by saying this, many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him.